Welcome to the Southeastern Railway Museum. This is our switch engine 8202, former Southern SW7. It was donated to us many, many, many years ago by the Southern Railway, and it has been a mainstay of our switching operations for many years. Uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, we took it out of service. Uh, we are having some trouble with it derailing because of wheel wear. And it's been uh, sitting around for a while as we work uh, now and then as we have time on uh, rebuilding the trucks. Uh, courtesy of Norfolk Southern, uh, we got new traction motors for it. And courtesy of MARTA Metropolitan uh, Transit Authority here in Atlanta, they turned the wheel sets and uh, again Norfolk Southern reassembled the combos. So we're in the process of putting the trucks back together. We've got the rear truck complete and we are starting on assembling the uh, um, other truck. So uh, that's what this video is going to be about. And uh, here we go. This is our assembled switch engine truck. Uh, it's a, a pretty simple design. Uh, it's been around since probably the 1920s, 1940s. Uh, a lot of people call it the AAR switcher truck. I think it's been around longer than the Association of American Railroads. But it's pretty simple. Uh, it's kind of hard to work on as far as maintenance, but it's simple to assemble, uh, simple to understand. The um, really two major parts. There's the truck frame. I'll show you a different a, uh, one apart here in, in a minute. And then you have the equalizers. The truck frame sits on the uh, what's called a semi-elliptical spring which is not showing up very well in the light. Uh, we'll pause a second and get the flashlight out. But that's the semi-elliptical spring and then the middle of the truck frame sits on that. And then that there's also a big coil spring, so there's two different sets of springs that support the truck. And this is the truck frame assembly. Uh, it's one big casting, and complete with my toolbox and a bunch of other junk sitting on top of it. But this just uh, will slide down on top of the equalizer and journals, journal boxes. Uh, interesting thing about the way these work, um, this is what's called the center plate or center casting. And on these, these particular trucks, the cooling air for the traction motors goes through that center hole, through the uh, truck casting, and then out these, uh, these ducts into the traction motor. Uh, the other thing that's there that you can see there, if I can zoom in on it, which is not going to focus, but you know, whatever. Um, that's called a spring pack, and that's actually what the two jaws of the traction motor connect into, and that's what holds the traction motor and transmits the torque of the motor into the truck frame. Of course, another major part of the truck is the brake rigging, and this is one of the inside brake hangers. Uh, we haven't set the brake cylinders on, but the brake cylinder engages the top of that brake hanger right there, and then there's also uh, brake straps which connect that brake hammer, hanger and brake shoe to the outside one which is hanging here behind all these rags and junk. Uh, there, you can see it better on this one if I don't make you dizzy with my swinging around. But uh, So once we get the truck assembled that's one of the things we do is to hook up the brake straps and one of the maintenance issues is anytime you change a traction motor or change a wheel You've got to disconnect all those brake straps and get them out of the way before you can drop the traction motor down. We built the equalizers assemblies long before I even had any thoughts about making a video. So this is a little bit of a mock-up using one extra equalizer bar that we happen to have. Uh, do a little bit of explanation about how these things work. Um, the um, ears of the equalizer we focus. The, ear, the ears of the equalizer of course sit on the uh, 
on the journal box, that's this area right here. And then um, the spring assemblies and the, the spring assemblies sit in this pocket assembly, which I've mocked up here. This is an old one. Um, you can see it rides on this uh, top of the equalizer bar. That is an area that tends to wear out a lot. So uh, a lot of times you'll see these uh, equalizer bars either being replaced or uh, being welded up in the area that wears. The other area that wears is this area right here where it sits on top of the journal box. And finally, we move back over to this hole. There's a big bolt that goes through here that holds everything together. There's one on either side. That hole, that bolt hole is also a wear point. So these have all had to be re redone. Um, this one, you can't see it because it's a little too, too close, but uh, there's a bushing in there that's been bored out and it's uh, had a bushing installed. Uh, going back over here, this is a spring pocket and uh, what most people call a gib um, walking around. You can see this is the, where the spring sits in the uh, pocket. Um, this other thing that's green is actually, that's called a uh, at least one name for it is the gib. The uh, elliptic spring has a slot in it and the elliptic, the uh, tail of that gib actually fits through the elliptic spring slot and then there's a key that goes in there. Um, the other part of the spring pocket that's hanging down with the small bolt through it is actually a safety hanger. There's actually a pin that goes through there and in case the uh, gib breaks, and that does happen, that uh, safety hanger will hold the, the elliptic spring in so it doesn't drop down and drag on the tracks, which would be a really bad thing. So overall, this is, this is what an elliptic spring, or at least half of the equalizer assembly looks like. I'll move over and uh, show you a picture of the uh, assembled uh, truck with the bottom side of it where you can see the elliptic spring and how it uh, ties in. Here's a looking, crawl, laying on my back looking at the uh, end of the elliptic spring and the uh, uh, gib and the gib key that's holding the elliptic spring in. So you can kind of see, it's a little difficult because it's a weird angle, but you can see the uh, the end of the elliptic spring with the end of the gib sticking through and the key and then further back there's the uh, there's the safety hanger that uh, or safety pin that keep to protect in case the uh, gib breaks and the, the elliptic spring end will drop down onto that pin instead of dragging the tracks so and then looking back that's the other end of the elliptic spring so for what that's worth. Focus doesn't work too well, so. Anywho, this is what it looks like. This is a view of the top of the spring pocket. You can see the coil spring sitting in the spring pocket, and that's the elliptic spring uh, going down to the gib where it ties in. This is what uh, truck uh, journal box looks like uh, when it's assembled. The uh, shiny uh, go brass is called brass. That's uh, what actually rubs against the uh, journal or the axle. Um, the uh, above it, you might be able to see, is what they what's called a wedge. It's an adapter which adapts the uh, journal brass to the uh, journal box and then the way this thing works is uh, down on the bottom of the uh, journal box that will be filled with oil and uh, there's what's called a journal pad in there which uh, will uh, soak the oil up and wick it onto the axle and the axle will bring it around onto the uh, brass and that's what lubricates the uh, 
journal in the wheel and keeps it going. This is what the journal box looks like when it's fully assembled. The uh, cross pieces there are actually a thrust, uh, thrust springs. There's about 11 of them and then they hold a uh, brass thrust plate against the end of the axle and that's what keeps the axle from moving laterally. Uh, down at the bottom of the journal box you can kind of see the journal oil down there. Uh, what you can't see is the pad that's back behind the um, thrust blocks uh, but that pad uh, brings the uh, oil up and lubricates the bearing. Interesting story about uh, journal bearings. This is pretty much old school up until about the 1930s. Every locomotive and every car had some variation of this design. Uh, and uh, Timken invented or uh, was able to adapt Ro tapered roller bearings for locomotive and freight car and passenger car operations um, and that's where the name friction bearing came from. Timken wanted to sell their products so they named this style, the older uh, journal bearings as friction bearings which has a negative connotation. There's really nothing wrong with this design. Uh, it's railroads don't use it anymore. The biggest problem with it you know, is that uh, you've got to maintain it. You've got to oil it every so often and when you have a hundred car freight train and somebody forgets to put oil in one of the journal boxes at a terminal, it has problems. So the biggest advantage to roller bearings, which is what you know all modern rolling stock locomotives, passenger cars and freight cars have, is that you don't have to do any kind of maintenance to them. Just as uh, information, this is a, a freight car journal box, and you can see the journal oil down at the bar, or the journal pad down at the bottom, and probably you can see the oil as well. Uh, and again, up in there you can barely see the brass back up in that in the box. But again, it's a, a very simple design, and it works very well. Okay, the gang's all back, and uh, we've put three of the four boxes on, so maybe we'll get it right this time for the last one. So what they're doing now is uh, lubricating the journal box uh, rear sea oil seal, and then that gets shoved into the journal box, which is what he's doing right now. That felt good. All right, let me double check this. Yeah, I found the bald spot here. Glass of your grease. Focus. Thank you. Anywho, that's where it's supposed to go. Even if it doesn't want to focus. the box and I'm going to trip over the tripod. See if I can do it again. First. I mean, can you get this up a bit more this door? Does it come up well, I had to help getting the brass and the wedge in on that box, so we got it together. We're bringing the uh, equalizer down, and that will. Uh, space everything correctly and get it in position for when we decide when we're ready to put the uh, truck frame on. So they're coming down with the equalizer even as we speak.
equalizer is in position. So this is about all we're going to do today. You see the equalizers setting in the slots on the journal box. Of course, this is our partially assembled truck. Uh, we've got the uh, equalizers on both sides and you can see you know, there's the semi-elliptical spring and then these are the pockets for the big coil springs and the coil springs are sitting right here so we'll be putting those in in a minute. Uh, traction motors uh, right there. If you ever, haven't ever seen a traction motor this is these are just plain old ordinary D77 traction motors. Um, we've got four leads uh, two go to the armature and two go to the field, so that's what those are right there. And of course the motor hangs on the axle, and the other end of the motor will actually hang on the truck frame. Uh, to get, get it there, we'll have to jack those motors up and put them on blocks and then drop the frame on top of it, but you'll see that in a little while. Okay folks, we got, uh, we got the truck in position, we got the traction motors jacked up so they'll clear the spring packs on the uh, uh, truck frame. We've got a train going by making racket that's not minor distraction. Got the springs in place so we are ready to lift up the truck frame and cross our fingers, drop it in. Alright, moment of truth. We've got the uh, truck frame, we're ready to lower it onto the equalizer and traction motor assembly. So, here goes the fun.
Well, the camera stopped recording sometime or another, so I guess we'll find out where. Okay, she's yeah. up on blocks. Uh, got a few more little details to attend to before we can start working on uh, uh, putting the rest of the uh, pieces on, but all is good. All right, ready to? Well, the truck is in position to continue the final assembly. Uh, it's somewhat of a challenge to get everything lined up as we drop down the uh, drop the frame down on the truck. Uh, in particular, the traction motor nose pieces have to engage the uh, uh, spring packs. I'll show you that in just a second. So there's the spring pack and the nose of the traction motor has to, the bottom of that nose has to, the uh, nose had to, has to clear the spring pack as we drop the frame down so the trick is you jack the traction motors up at an angle so that there's enough distance uh, between the top uh, nose piece right there and the truck frame and, and bring it down past that nose piece and then gradually lower it down, lower the traction motors down. Uh, that's what the jacks were and that's what takes a long time. Plus the jacks that we were using weren't necessarily the greatest for that application. But uh, we got her done. So. There's the traction motor with the nose piece engaged. One of the challenges with doing a project like this when you do stuff and then a couple years later you come back to it is you forget all the subtle tricks and challenges that you have. And these traction motor boots are a perfect example. Um, it looks like it's real easy. Just stick the bolts through the uh, retainer and through the boot and into the traction motor and tighten them up. Well, it's not quite so simple and I'll show you on a different one here. Okay, here's a sample. This is an extra traction motor boot along with the retainer that uh, keeps the boot in place or keeps it from bending. But the problem is when this thing is up against a traction motor and you stick the screw in, well, it doesn't want to go. It doesn't want to go because the holes are kind of tight. So you kind of have to hold the thing in position and work at it 
to get the, the uh, cap screw through the hole. Finally, you know, with a little bit of effort, you can do that. Now you can't do it when the bolt, when some of the uh, um, when the boot's in place on the traction motor. So we're going to have to do a little bit different tacks. Well, we're going to try to get these uh, traction motor boots into the motor. I did the other one off camera because uh, trying to figure out uh, my technique, shall we say. Uh, one of the things that we did was we sharpened the edges, ends of the cap screws so that they go through the rubber a little bit more easily. So, not sure how much of this is going to be visible and how much of it's going to be blocked by me struggling with this thing, but here we go. You can also see that the boot's a little bit off, off center. At least we got the bolt kind of in the hole. Maybe it'll start. That's the big challenge with this. Now, miracle upon miracle, that started. Let's try this one. tendency to pretend that they've started when they really haven't. That needs to be a big struggle. That one started. Okay. Well, that's really good. Now this one I expect from the body is locking the view. But can't be helped. And putting the taper on those really did a great job. There are six of these, and three of them are above, or four of them are two from above. And this one's not starting yet. Sometimes they pretend like they started and think they're going, and they aren't. But, uh, you know, I honestly don't know how in the world. I don't know full-time railroads where they had to do this on a regular basis and they managed to fight these things. It's not starting. Well, it's not starting because the boot has slipped out of position. Time to work from below to get to it. And that is going to likely be off camera because I don't think you'll be able to see much. So here we go. So this is what it looks like from down below. The lighting is pretty awful, but I do the best I can with what I got. You can see the bolts there and hither and yon. And it's kind of fun to reach up in there and grab them, but anywho, this is the bottom side of a traction motor and such, for what it's worth. So this is a view of the uh, traction motor, it's called the spring pack. Um, oh, coming down on it. The, the spring pack uh, holds the nose of the traction motor, so as it rocks up and down, uh, it gives it a little bit of cushion. Um, the stud that you can see right there is actually to compress the spring pack so that we can get it in and uh, get it in position. And now that it is in position and the motor's in position, I need to go underneath there and loosen the uh, nut on the bottom to loosen the, the uh, stud and expand, let the spring pack expand. So that's the next step, and I'll probably do, I will do that off camera. And we are now at the process of uh, finishing installing the brake rigging. Uh, long ago we put the brake hangers, that's what this is, that's the outside one. And the inside one's pretty hard to see. Uh, but uh, we're now going to go ahead and put the brake straps on. And I'll walk around here and you can see what they look like. We have the one in position, we haven't hooked it up yet. But it's lying. 
lying on the truck there and we'll hook that up here in a minute. Alright, this is a brake strap uh, assembly sitting on the bench. It's uh, put together. Um, not the bolts aren't tight yet because it's easier to adjust as we need to and then this part here is what's called a slack adjuster uh, it's what uh, we use to take up the slack and uh, adjust for the wear on brake shoes and also give us room to take the brake shoes to change the brake shoes right now i'm laying underneath the uh, the truck and what you see there is the bottom of the inside brake hanger uh, there's the, the yellow is the brake shoe, inside brake shoe. Uh, one of the interesting challenges here is the uh, bolt that we use to secure the brake straps to the inside hanger um, is, will not go into the hole for the brake rigging or the brake, brake hanger because it's too high. And if uh, if this truck probably was under a locomotive, there'd be enough weight to compress the springs. But since there isn't, uh, what we'll do is we'll take the use the crane. We'll take the pins out from up uh, up above, lower this down to give us the room to get the brake uh, strap bolt in. So here we've got the uh, pins out of the upper brake hanger supports and strap around the brake uh, lever and we've lowered it down. So now we've got the uh, brake hanger lowered down and the bolt should go in just like that. Okay, here's the inner uh, brake hanger with the brake strap installed, bolt in place, raised back up uh, to the proper position and again you can see how the uh, bottom of the brake hanger is a little bit higher than the bottom of the equalizer. So, well, I tried to shoot a video of us assembling this end of the, uh, putting the slack adjuster into the uh, outer brake hanger, but it's such a struggle because things aren't never generally line up just right. So, we had to do a lot of cursing and struggling and bending and pulling. So this is what it looks like when it's assembled. The uh, um, brake hanger is on the inside. There's a spacer and then the outside is a slack adjuster. And we'll take a bar and such in a little while and put the brake shoes in and get the slack correct. So this is pretty much what it looks like. Alright, start putting it on. These guys are putting the last brake shoe on. The trick here is you you lay the brake shoe on top of the wheel and then kind of roll it down in position. It's going to be a bit of a challenge to get in where they where you can see it while they're doing their work. Because it can be a real struggle as well. Hopefully. <laughs> A little bit further down. A little further down. Right there and there we go. Right there, right there. Right, I'll hold it. Yep, I'm holding. Got the key in there. Almost. What's going on down here? Hmm. You want me to try to get the hammer to deform it? Nope. It should just slide through. We have to go try another key. It's like just. If you've got the key part way in, yeah. take the slack up and then maybe you can it. pull so the key. Put, put it in. Yeah, go ahead and use the bar to take the slack up. There's a whole lot of different ways to pry on this. The way the slack adjuster is made is those holes are not quite in alignment so you can use one and one to move it part way and then use the second one to move it the rest of the way. And if one doesn't line up, the other one will. 
So now we're putting the second brake cylinder on the truck. So they've got it on the crane and bringing it around. Uh, lowering the brake cylinder in place. Brake cylinder fully installed and pins in place. You see the pin for the uh, inside brake hanger, brake lever. Nuts and bolts to hold the brake cylinder down. Opposite end, and you can also see the uh, uh, support pins for the brake hanger. We're in the process of installing the pedestal liners. The pedestal liners are these nylon uh, pieces that go between the um, journal box, either side of the journal box and the truck frame. And they serve as a wear surface so the, as the box and the wheels go up and down they wear into the pedestal liners instead of wearing into the uh, uh, surface of the truck frame or the uh, journal box. Um, we opted to wait until we got the truck frame installed, a, a truck frame assembled, before we did the pedestal liners because that gives us a little bit more room to drop the truck down over the journal box and allow for any kind of misalignment with the crane. That's the good part. The bad part is if they aren't quite aligned, which they aren't, uh, it can be awfully difficult to get the pedestal liner shoved up uh, between the journal box and the jaws of the truck frame. And that's where we are now. We basically lubricated them and uh, jacked them into place. Okay, one of the tricks that we use to get the thing started is uh, to bevel the edges of it. So we're going to commit grinder abuse here. So basically just take the pedestal and bevel it like so. So when it's all said and done, we've got a bevel, bevel on the end top of the pedestal liner, which should help us get it in place. Once we get it in place, we can usually jack it up and get it to go. All right, so we're going to put this thing in, and give it a little motivation, hopefully it'll go in. So we've done the first round of jacking the pedestal liner in place, so here we go on the rest. Another round. And it is in place now. All the way up. The next step is to install the pedestal tie bars. These connect the two jaws together and keep everything, keep the boxes from coming out if something unnatural should happen. Unfortunately, what happens with these things over time is these holes get uh, 
crud in them so that you can't get the bolt in. So we get our wrist breaker drill here and cross our fingers that we don't do just that. Like that. <laughs> Almost got me, but not quite. And do the, do the good old machine to wall her out. So now the bolt should, if everything works right, drop the washer down. Goes in. One thing about these bolts, the outside's fairly easy to get a wrench on the head. The inside over on this side is nearly impossible. So the dirty little trick is to weld a uh, another bolt across the head so that when it hits the side, you can turn it. Don't look too closely at my welding job because that's the very first MIG welding job I ever did. So it'll hold. It may not be pretty, but it'll hold. Putting the pedestal tie bars in place and uh, it's pretty heavy, so we're going to use hydraulic power instead of muscle power. We'll go ahead. Hopefully, it won't fall. Go ahead and jack it up. Huh? All right, going up. I don't want to go up much. I don't want to weigh it down. That's fine. No, don't let it down yet. So, get a nut on them, nut them both of them, or nut on one side. Now we'll lower it a little bit, that's good. And that other nut will have to replace, and you should be able to get the nut on our missile, which we did. Magic. Okay, last bit. We take the big old three-quarter drive impact and run these things up. So prepare for some rack. That's all she wrote. This white fuzzy sponge looking thing is a journal pad. <clears throat> the journal pads are what soak up the uh, oil in the bottom of the journal box and transfer it to the bottom of the uh, journal or the axle on the uh, bearings. So next thing that has to happen is we'll take these journal pads and soak them in oil for a little while, let them soak up soak up journal oil and then the messy task of shoving them into the journal box which is right there so the box is empty obviously and we'll put the journal pads in and then fill the box up with oil and should be good to go we're going to be putting the journal pads in I've already learned the hard way so probably make a mess you don't like messes, this is not the job for you. So, this journal pad's been sitting in journal oil for a day or two. Soak it up, it's like a gigantic sponge, gigantic mess, but here we go. Just have to 
work it back and forth. Squeezing it underneath the picture. We have a tool that helps the process. Fairly even, probably even up, on, even up on its own. Trying to get it. So you can see the uh, pad soaks the oil up from the bottom of the box, wipes it on the bot on the, the journal that comes around and lubricates the brass, and keeps everything all nice and. Lubricate it up. So now we're going to install the journal thrust blocks. This is the brass block with the uh, felt uh, wick which soaks the oil up and uh, distributes it on the ends of the axles of the journals. I had to replace those. Uh, McMaster Car helped us out on that. It's just basically a felt strip. Uh, in addition to the thrust blocks, these uh, metal uh, plates or we call them spring plates actually uh, hold it in place and uh, control the lateral. So the process is we'll put the thrust block in and then slide the uh, metal uh, plates in one at a time from the side. That's what these holes are in the side of the journal box is for. Here's the thrust block. There are two springs, one goes on the inside, one goes on the outside. So like that. And then another one here. And then we start shoving the plates in between. First few are very easy. It's the last ones that get to be more of a challenge. Sometimes they get to be a real challenge.
we're at the point now where we've got the last uh, two of the nine uh, plates to go in and they're always fairly hard because we're pushing and pressing the, everything and pushing the uh, box out and the journal in so it's a lot of pounding with a hammer which is the next step. See how we're doing over here. So yep. far, so the good. In, so Keep a pounding. And they are in. So, everything's in. All we got to do is put the covers back on. So, these are the covers that go on either side of the box. This one's not quite all the way in. And the thrust block assembly is in. We're almost through with the project. About the last thing we got to do is to fill the uh, support bearings. And the support bearings are what uh, allows the traction motor to ride on the axles. And uh, if you look, this little yellow dot, or yellow, that is the filler for the support bearing. So we've got uh, four to do and I'll probably just film one so here we go okay so funnel in the fill uh, fill spout hopefully we won't spill too much it takes a lot more than I thought it would here we go with the journal oil second load can't really tell how much is in there until it starts to overflow. So that's pretty much what we did on the railroad and that's what we're going to do here. And it's done. So we're two down and two to go. So this is the other end of the truck and we'll go ahead and fill those up off camera. One other little thing we're just going to check. Uh, this is the gear case and this is what uh, uh, there's a small gear on the traction motor and a big gear on the uh, axle called the bull gear. And we're just going to check to be sure there's lubrication in here. Can't get a very good shot of it but that's the bull gear in there. and. Uh, Lots of really thick grease. You do not want to get that stuff on your clothes or on your shoes because it does not like to come off. Well, we're pretty much finished. You're going to have to excuse the noise. We've got some contractors working in here. But uh, we put the truck back on the rails almost. We did that off camera. Um, it's the same thing as when we put it, picked it back up on the blocks. Um, Next step will be to put the trucks underneath the locomotive. But before we do that, I thought we'd do a hey watch this uh, segment. So here we go. We'll follow these cables.
and the cables go back to a welder. And being as how this is a DC motor, we can uh, fire it up. And without further ado, make the magic happen. So around and around she goes. Well, this project is finished. The next step is to, is to put the two trucks, the swim and this one back there, underneath the locomotive. That'll be another video. Before we go, I just want to thank all the folks who helped me out with this project. We've got Amin, Nathan, Ryan, Nick Fraser, Nick Henderson, and then a few folks who aren't here. Uh, Mike Lippincott, Caleb Samples, Andrew Jordan, Jackson Stewart, Elijah Gogan. So, and anybody else that I happen to miss, I really thank everybody. Uh, like this, you might check out the Southeastern Railroad Museum's website. Uh, got a lot of pieces of equipment here, a lot of things to look at. So again, thank you very much and enjoy.